Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you all today in person and online. Um, the title of my talk is Rethinking the Sea in Maternal and Child Health, the Role of the Community in Addressing Health Disparities. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work I conducted when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship in Baltimore, Maryland. So the title of my research project was called Drumming Up Data, uh, a Maternal and Child Health Community-Based Participatory Research Project. Before I go into specific details, I want to start off by defining exactly what community-based participatory research is. And essentially, it's a collaborative approach between the academic and community institution um, that equitably involves all partners in the research project from conception of idea to evaluation. And so it recognizes the unique strengths that each party brings. And CBPR begins with a research topic of importance to the community at hand and has the aim of combining knowledge with action and achieving social change to improve community health and eliminate health disparities. So a little bit about the organization I worked with uh, during my fellowship. I worked with Drew Mondam and Healthy Families, hence the name DRUM, and hence the title of my project, Drumming Up Data. And DRUM Healthy Families uh, is committed to providing a strength-based approach to supporting families and pregnant women and their children um, from birth all the way through school readiness and looking to really enhance the lives of these women um, and parents and have a positive impact on the safety and development of these children. And the scope of this project is related back to one of the uh, founding principles of CBPR, which is recognizing the community as a unit of identity, and principle number two, which builds upon the existing strengths and resources. So an overview of my presentation and my project was that, as I stated, this is a CBPR project that evaluated the effectiveness of the home visitation model Healthy Families America in the state of Maryland. And the focus of the evaluation was twofold. It was really to determine the impact that DRUM, this community-based agency, is having in the environment, and having, um, excuse me, in the community from the perspective of the client and looking to see how the skills that these clients garnered through going through the home visitation program really impacted their lives, their life skills, their decision-making skills, their self-efficacy, and also what impact did this program have on their family planning and birth outcomes for future trajectory and children. So in 2009, um, there were 128 infant deaths in the city of Baltimore, which is more than 10 per month. And Baltimore City has the highest rate of infant mortality in the state of Maryland. And looking at this at a rate of 13.5 per 1,000 live births, the infant mortality rate in the city of Baltimore is almost twice as high as the state of Maryland, which is 7.3. So you can see we're clearly dealing with an epidemic of infant mortality in the city, and every effort to reduce this uh, disparity is definitely appreciated. And so DRUM is one of many entities in the city working on this issue of public health significance. Um, and 60% of Baltimore's 10,000 births a year are considered to be high risk due to poverty, previous birth outcomes, and other risk factors that the women and their families are facing. So just to paint a little bit of a picture and some background um, as to what is going on in the city of Baltimore with regards to infant mortality. So looking at some data here, we have the state of Maryland uh, rate of preterm birth, which is defined as the birth of a baby before 37 weeks. And we have Baltimore City's preterm birth rate. We have some similar communities within the city of Baltimore that DRUM encompasses as far as their geographic catchment area. So I wanted to show that to you all. I I don't know if you guys can see the numbers, but um, this looks at the low birth weight of the city of Baltimore as it compares to the state of Maryland. And we know that low birth weight is defined as the birth of an infant less than 2,500 grams. And so you can see Baltimore has extremely high rates of infant mortality. When you look at different neighborhoods within the city, um, the disparity is even greater. 
So this study was a two-part study. Uh, the first part was a series of focus groups. Like I said earlier, I really wanted to gauge the effectiveness of the program from the perspective of the client. And so I conducted a series of focus groups with particular stakeholders, uh, including women who have graduated from the home visitation program, women who were currently enrolled in the program at the time I did the study, um, women who started the program and did not finish. I wanted to know what factors mediated that outcome. Male partners, because I feel it's very important to have men in the conversation when you're looking at families and pregnancy and the role of men as sources of social support for their pregnant partners and also uh, the family support workers themselves who actually delivered the intervention and were the ones going into the homes and providing services for these women. So the inclusion criteria was that you had to live in these particular neighborhoods in, in Baltimore that DRUM encompassed, and they had to have been in the program in the past five years at that time, so 2007 to 2012. And the study setting took place at the actual nonprofit headquarters. The second phase or the second part of the study was an observational study where I looked at just gleaning some um, quantitative data from the women and looking at only the women who've graduated from the program to determine what impact has the program had on their lives now that they've had a chance to go through the entire curriculum, implement some of the skills, and um, look at some of the things that they were exposed to and how that made a difference in their life. And so the inclusion criteria for that was, again, women living in these neighborhoods and women who have been in the program 2007 to 2012. So the, the first phase, phase was a series of focus groups, as I stated, and um, some of the domains that I wanted to look at were how is participating in the drum home visitation program influenced your life? And then I had a series of subset of questions related to that main question. And then the second one was a short quantitative survey that the women, um, was, it was self-administered, looking at different domains, such as their family planning outcomes, the receipt of prenatal care, um, birth outcomes, their self-efficacy. Do they feel empowered to make positive impacts um, regarding their children, their family, their career trajectories? as a result of the knowledge that they were exposed to in this home visitation program. So the first phase was, was qualitative data, and I analyzed that just verbatim, looking for major themes that emerged, um, doing selective coding, axial coding. And then the second phase, which actually included some quantitative and descriptive statistics, was analyzed using SPSS. So here are some of the results that I pulled out from the women and the men um, qualitatively. And so what are some of the strengths of the organization? That was one of the questions I asked. And they said, DRUM teaches you how to be patient when you're dealing with your children. So very clear life skills that they were exposed to. I like how the FSW or family support worker um, asked about me as well. That's from the male perspective. They even helped me to find a job. So you see this organization is really looking at the family as a holistic um, a approach to it and looking and seeing, okay, we have the male partner. How can we make sure that he's included in the conversation? How can we make sure that his needs are being met as well? Um, so DRUM helps me with housing, shelter, resources. Okay. The family support workers love the work and the clients, and they do not get paid a million dollars to be here. That theme came across, and as many of you know, in nonprofit management, it is hard to sustain and grow programs, um, particularly in this cash-strapped situation that a lot of them find themselves in. But the women and the family support workers were very committed to the work, and the clients got that. That resonated with them. Uh, when I first started here, I didn't have a place to stay. I was pregnant, I didn't have a job, you know, all of these life stressors that these women are dealing with. And the FSW sat down with the woman, helped her work through the goals, write down the goals, and little by little she saw that she was starting to accomplish what she had laid out for herself. So we're building self-efficacy, we're building empowerment, and these skills are sustainable in these communities. So long after I'm gone, long after um, the FSW has finished with this particular caseload, the skill that they've given these women will be sustainable and the women will be empowered to continue to apply this to other facets of their life. 
So what are some of the influences that drum has had on their children? Um, drum helped me with a lot of developmental things with regards to age-appropriate things that your child should be doing. Okay, so there's a focus on the cognitive functioning and academic performance and readying the child for school. Drum provided me with a car seat, books, and many other resources. So again, we see that tangible relationship of, of goods. Um, the FSWs provided me with many skills and information that I still use today with my children. I am thankful for them. Okay? Drum became a part of the family. Whatever I can do to give back to them, I will. And I just want to spend a second to talk about um, looking at the community perspective from an assets-based model. And what does that mean for these communities of color who are considered to be vulnerable and marginalized and disproportionately impacted? But there are a lot of strengths in these communities. And the willingness to give back and to volunteer and to provide peer-based support to other parents came across really strong in every group that I spoke to, um, that the women and the men and the family support workers were very connected to making sure that the health of these Baltimorean children was as on par with any health outcome or cognitive outcome as a child in Baltimore County or across the state or across the country. So I definitely want to emphasize the fact that, um, yes, Baltimore does have its unique challenges, but there are a lot of strengths, and not just unique to Baltimore, but unique to communities of color across the country. And so I would urge all of us to look at health disparities from really an assets-based model and talk to people in the community and see what existing strengths and resources are already there that we can tap into as opposed to coming in. And that's the difference between CBPR, traditional research, if you will. CBPR works with the community. We're equal partners. Um, in the decision-making process and ultimately eliminating health disparities in the community that needs it from their perspective. So um, looking at some of the results from phase two, the demographic data, um, the average age of the, of the woman that has graduated from the program, so this is only a subset of the women who have successfully completed the program. Um, the average age was 27. Everyone in the program was um, African American. Most of them had at least a high school education. The majority of them were single, unmarried. Um, about half were employed full time, and about 20% were employed part time. So, looking at um, the total number of births in this population, so again, this was a subset of women, um, more than the overwhelming majority of them had normal birth weight babies, which is defined as at least 2,500 grams. And so we see a subset, almost 8%, 7.4% of them actually had low birth weight babies. Um, when we look at preterm birth, the, a larger number of the women in this sample had preterm birth, which again is defined as the birth of an infant at less than 37 weeks. But the majority of them also um, carried to term. So in addition to the quantitative survey, I asked them some open-ended questions just to kind of give them an opportunity to say what was on their mind and not be so structured in a focus group or things of that nature. So just open-ended question at the end of the survey, what is the best way that DRUM has influenced you? They said, uh, they did a lot for me. I'm happy that there's a program like this to help mothers with their children. This particular quote um, really resonated with me. Drum has provided me with an immeasurable amount of emotional support. Sometimes you just need someone to help calm you or remind you that you can achieve your goals. Drum has been that for me. So these type of life skills, um, you, you, you really can't measure them. As the participant said here, it's an immeasurable amount of emotional support. Drum gives me what I need to be able to continue to thrive. Thank you. So what did I learn from, from this uh, research experience? Obviously, DRUM provides an invaluable resource to the residents of Baltimore City, and the women who have participated in the program have really gained a lot of life and parenting skills as a result of their inclusion that have allowed them to effectively parent and support their families, but also their peer families, their cousins, their neighbors. Um, I saw a lot of women coming in with neighbors like, oh, I know, you know, such and such is pregnant. I'm going to bring her in because I know this is a safe space for her where she can get resources for her children and her family. And um, many of the clients, as we saw looking at that uh, pie chart, have had healthy full-term pregnancies. So we know that the program is definitely effective in that way. 
And uh, also, the male partners and husbands, which I cannot overstate enough, play an essential role in the lives of women that they support. So another aspect of the fellowship was, was looking at um, funding, and so going to Annapolis and advocating for increased funding from home, for home visitation at the state level. Um, and ideally, DRUM will be, and I'm still working with them now actually, um, DRUM will be able to use information to strengthen its program base, to provide um, additional resources to the evidence base and the success of this particular Healthy Families America model that they're implementing, and enhance their fundraising capacity. And as we uh, spoke about earlier in nonprofit, it's very imperative to have multiple streams and um, discretionary funding, things of that nature, and increasing the ability to advocate for the comprehensive approach to addressing poor birth outcomes. That was probably one of the biggest take home messages that I remember um, going to Annapolis, taking some of our women participants, some of the actual mothers, the staff, myself, and really making a concerted effort to say to legislature, this is an important program that needs additional funding. And so, you know, at the federal level, working with Congressman Cummings from uh, the state of Maryland and his office to provide resources to them to strengthen their evidence base and um, to support initiatives that they may be implementing regarding infant mortality and family planning um, that would open up additional streams of income and funding for maternal child health programs in the city of Baltimore. And that's kind of one of the long-term principles of CBPR, which is that commitment it's not just um, the scope of the project as it currently stands. I have been, I finished my fellowship over a year ago and I'm still working with them and still trying to be a resource to that community because I understand the impact that it has. So obviously this was not um, a completely rigorous, scientifically rigorous study, but it was nonetheless very important and very sustainable and very impactful for DRAM. And, um, I, as you can imagine, this population is really hard to track down over long periods of time, and so we did have some problems um, locating some of the women, and um, it was hard to find people. But they may have a different profile than the women that we were able to find. But given what we had, I think um, it still shows a really solid case for the benefits of this particular home visitation model in this community. And that's all I have. I think we're going to do questions at the end, correct? Okay. So here's my contact information, and thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Now we are having the second present presenter, and then at the end we, have, we are having questions. Everybody. My name is Carolyn DeBoer. Um, I work for an agency called the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, and I'm here to talk about a statewide initiative in New Jersey specifically um, to reduce black infant mortality. Um, we'll just do a quick outline so we all know what's coming up. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, the objectives of the presentation uh, as well as the methods and then the discussion with the implications of the findings and the conclusion at the end. So uh, a little bit about the initiative itself. Um, this time period was uh, the early mid 90s and New Jersey was in the media for some not very good reasons. Um, there were uh, incidents of racial profiling that had made the news um, on the Turnpike and Parkway. Um, there was a lot of media focus on that. And the budget situation in the state was very different from what it is now. There was a little bit more money floating around. So at that point, the state was willing to, you know, devote some resources to this initiative. Um, there were um, 
it was really a groundswell. I think it was a little bit of the right place at the right time. This is something where um, I think uh, the state government had seen that it was, it was time to do something. Um, in terms of the strategies, we'll talk a little bit about the methods that surrounded the initial development of the initiative um, and how those methods can be applied to other locations. Um, we'll talk about the lessons that were learned um, in developing that initiative and the challenges that we went through in trying to um, push it forward and the successes that the initiative has had since then, uh, since it's been almost 10 years now, more so. Um, and uh, a little bit about the implications. Um, there are some, some uh, possibilities for public policy, um, things that relate to women's studies specifically, and uh, you know, things that we can talk about within the black community. Um, there's a piece to play for everyone, and the conclusions at the end. So the partnership is a maternal child health consortium. Um, not every state has these agencies. They're licensed by the Department of Health. And they, um, the regs say they do something really vague like uh, rationalize maternal child health care. But what that really means is we um, look at the needs um, that are in maternal child health and the needs of the community and try to help the healthcare system be a little bit more responsive and reflective to what goes on. Um, one thing that we do as a result of that license is we handle birth certificate data. And New Jersey was unique in that they were one of the first states to have an electronic birth certificate um, that was developed in, I want to say 1993 or 1994, and it's got 440 some indicators, so it's not just what you see on your birth certificate, it's mom's health history, and um, there's a lot of information on there. So having access to that data um, really and being asked to monitor it put us in a unique position to look at um, you know, the different indicators and to look at disparities um, in the way the babies were being born and the health of the mom and the health of the baby. Um, as part of our work, we worked with the hospitals, um, were involved in professional education for the folks that work at hospitals, and we also have community-based um, services where we actually provide, like Healthy Families, the program that Nididi had mentioned, we um, actually provide that service as well. So we have partners in the community and um, the hospitals. And we also had a unique relationship with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies coalitions, which were um, these sort of more grassroots nonprofits that were operating within the community and were very well networked. Um, all of the people that were kind of change makers, that were whose opinions were respected, business owners and you know nurses who'd been you know working someplace for a really long time, just just folks that were really in the trenches, uh, were part of Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, and. The organization itself had a commitment to social justice, which I think is something that um, can't really be underestimated as an important part of trying to champion these initiatives. Um, you know, you have to have the passion to make, make things um, important first because it's not always an easy road. Um, so I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with this issue, but. Um, there is a huge disparity in infant mortality in terms of race ethnicity. And um, New Jersey's data uh, that was easily available went back to 2000, but it was actually higher for everyone before that. Um, and the top line up here, let's see, um, along here is uh, black non-Hispanic moms. And uh, these are the rest of the groups. Hispanic moms is the blue line um, and white non-Hispanic down here and Asian through here. So there's an enormous disparity, and these are based on statewide numbers, so um, they're pretty reliable. You're looking at on the order of, um, I want to say it's about 150,000 births for the whole state and several hundred um, incidences of infant mortality. And when you actually look at fetal mortality, I didn't bring those numbers, but the disparity is even greater. So these are just babies that were born alive and then died during their first year. Um, for moms that had experienced a miscarriage or a fetal loss, the, the disparity is even, even higher. So um, what had happened? Uh, the partnership um, had actually issued a white paper talking about um, the disparity in New Jersey's infant mortality rates. Um, we had our hands on this data. It was something that we thought really needed to be looked at and addressed. Um, and since we were working with the birth certificates, it was um, you know, in, an immediate uh, way to talk about it, to look at that data. 
Um, the governor at the time, um, Governor Whitman, uh, actually the office contacted the partnership and asked to meet with us and talk about the white paper. Um, and we got the health commissioner involved as well. And there was um, the decision to convene a blue room and panel. And that panel was 35 different folks, um, healthcare professionals and consumers, people that had all different uh, backgrounds. But one thing that was very important with that panel is that um, you know, the, the black and African American community made up the majority of the panel. We wanted people to have a voice um, in what was going on and make sure that um, the mom's voice was heard because there had been a lot of research done from a clinical perspective, but I think it's important to get at what the moms were experiencing. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Elise Zimmerman, um, who is my supervisor and coworker. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to make sure that everybody sees that picture, Carolyn. How does that picture go backwards? Um, backspace. backspace? Up there. Up there? Okay, now, does anybody recognize <laughs> this young woman standing? I, uh, for those of you that are still paying attention, whether by web or in the audience, can you see anybody who looks familiar? Because that was a mere 17 years ago. So some of us actually live this experience. And what I want to do is just share with you a little bit about the people in this picture. Because if somebody asked me, how do you mount a statewide initiative, I would give you that quote from Margaret Mead that suggests you need a small band of people. And here you have it. Here you have a small band of people. Um, I didn't introduce myself formally. Carolyn and I both work uh, in New Jersey. We're located in Newark. But at the time, this picture took place in Paramus, which was the location of our, our first office. And we had, at the very far end, Linda Ugu, who was an epidemiologist, a perinatal epidemiologist, which is very hard to find. She had a PhD and was interested in maternal child health. And then we had a woman who was a research scientist and a physician, Dr. Charles Bowers, who was a practicing OB, who was a close friend of mine from when we worked at Mount Sinai together. He was the associate chairman of OBGYN. I was the associate director of the hospital. So when we found each other both on the other side of the river, we started to talk about which babies are dying. It was somewhat scientific at first. If the consortia were responsible for decreasing infant death and morbidity, then we had to first look at the data to figure out who was our audience, who did we have to intervene with. And it turned out that black women were losing their babies two to four times more frequently than their white counterparts. And this had nothing to do with their age, with their income, with their marital status, or their education. That's really hard to believe. And the way I explained it this morning to some of the um, organizers of today's conference is, if you had a white woman who was impoverished, she didn't have uh, housing, she didn't have an income, and a black woman who was in the same situation, both of them would have babies who potentially were low birth weight or born too early, premature. If the white woman and the black woman both are able to get scholarships, go to school, they're able to get successful jobs, they get married, someone that they meet at, uh, on the job, and now they're living in the suburbs the likelihood of that white woman's baby being born too small and too early is significantly decreased, is significantly decreased. The likelihood that the black woman's baby will be born remains the same, born too small and born too early. 
The reason that this initiative to decrease black infant death is such a national priority is because it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense. There's no reason that these innocent children should have to suffer demise, should have to die, when in fact their moms are taking care of themselves. This is not an issue of teen birth. This is not an issue of drug use. This is not an issue of women who are mentally ill not focused on their children's well-being. There's a phenomenon that takes place in the United States where black women are under higher levels of stress and we have to figure out physiologically what does that do to their psyche, what does that do to their cortisol, what does that do to their retention of the baby in utero. Because statistically, regardless of their income, black women have birth earlier term and that presents a problem. Has anybody here that I can see ever been to a NICU? Has anybody been inside of a NICU with all those beeps and tiny little infants struggling? It's very heartwarming. You feel like you want to crawl next to them and, and give them a hand and make sure that they're sustained and give them something to look at. Low birth weight is in and of itself a predictor of death. If you're born too early and your lungs are immature, there's a higher likelihood that you won't be able to survive. All aspects of your body are not mature enough to fight what it's like to, to cope physiologically. I was talking to you about the OBGYN. What I want to share with you about Dr. Bowers is that when I told him that black women statistically suffer more infant death, he said, not in my practice. He said, I treat all women equally, and I'm not aware that their babies die more frequently. He's a practicing physician. I'm a public health specialist. So we had to go into the records. And all of a sudden, he became quite ill. And he said, I can't believe this. I never tracked the infant outcome. I made sure that the deliveries went as well as possible. But this is heartbreaking for me. And we were joined by a nurse, Beverly Henderson, who not only was a nurse, was a marketing specialist, but most importantly, she was a community activist. So she was able to get, as Carolyn said before, a good number of people in Newark, in East Orange, in orange, to come together around healthy mothers, healthy babies. She's a very dynamic woman and said, these rates are low. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And she advocated that we ask the community why they think they were losing children so that it wouldn't only be through scientists. I will tell you that pulling this group together and pushing back on our supporters, we received an amazing opportunity from the New Jersey Department of Health. They gave us the ability to create a blue ribbon panel. The only thing is they had some idea of what the composition of this panel should look like. And the people in that little band had different ideas. And if I were to leave you with a second thought, number one, don't underestimate what a small group of committed people can do. And number two, sometimes you have to push hard and settle for compromise. If we would have accepted the suggestions of all the people from the different levels of the state government, we might have had a different configuration or different composition. We really felt it was important that the majority of the people on this committee were of color, and we persevered. The Department of Health uh, suggested that we have three times when women and men could speak up there were women who came wearing the t-shirts of their deceased children to talk about what it was like to lose a baby. 
I have, for those of you who are interested, a booklet that we prepared called Speaking of Courage. What it is, is the stories of women who have lost children. And it's noted here, rising above the challenges of pregnancy and parenting. It's an internal publication, but what it gets at are some of the core findings that the Blue Ribbon Panel came up with. And the recommendations that came out of this group were, first of all, as Dr. Bowers was not aware, many practicing physicians, be they white or black, had no idea that black infants were at such a disadvantage. You have to keep in mind, this was almost 20 years ago, so there's been media, and now APHA has adopted the elimination of racial disparities as a priority. That wasn't the case in 1995. If you looked at the regulations of the state of New Jersey, we were supposed to look at geography. We were supposed to look at mom's weight. There was no mention of race. So one thing that we did was that we created a huge public awareness campaign so that physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists were all told, you cannot treat all people the same. You need to be particularly attentive to women who are at high risk. And if you are black, you are at higher risk regardless of all the factors that I mentioned before. Secondly, education. You know, we received quite a bit of resistance from black professionals who thought that this higher level of black infant death was racist propaganda. So as I have shared earlier with some colleagues, there were pickets around the places that we were meeting. White girl, go home. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Because I wasn't black, there was a tendency not to believe the statistics. And so I would show up with the MMR report, you know, the morbidity and mortality from the CDC, because I was new to New Jersey. As you can hear, I'm from Brooklyn. So what happened was that it took a long time for people to trust us that what we were saying was so, and that's where the education came in. The education was so significant that we petitioned the Medical Examiner's Office of New Jersey so that every physician who was licensed between 1997 and 2000, in order to get your license as a physician, you had to take a course in cultural competency. Now, some people really resented that. Some physicians said, are you suggesting that I'm not competent? And we had to be very careful with what we said because we need physicians to treat all patients with respect. But we also needed the physicians to recognize that if you presume that you know what this woman's life is like, you're likely to bias what you're suggesting. So the educational programs took place both at the community level there were women who didn't know where to go for pregnancy tests. And guess what? If you're not aware that you're pregnant and you're not happy when you find out that you are pregnant, you have a higher likelihood of losing your baby. So ambivalence is, in fact, a risk for that baby. So we need to make sure that women knew how to get access to family planning, access to prenatal care, we needed to hear what the community concerns were. I don't know as much about the New York hospital resources, but in New Jersey, I testified at seven different acute care hospitals that closed within a period of five years. Seven hospitals that had chains around them, people who were trying to get their medical record, who didn't know where to go for prenatal care, people who had gone to hospitals that were not religious institutions who are now having to be rerouted where they couldn't get access to family planning, they couldn't have a termination of pregnancy. These were all issues that we encompassed in this Blue Ribbon Panel report, which, by the way, we will stick around, Carolyn and I, for anybody who wants access to this information. I would say that 
Lesson number three, we generated attention and resources to this problem such that the Department of Health gave us funding to publish a book called Generations, which is written for black women specifically about how to take care of yourself. We developed a petals packet for black women to track their pregnancies and learn how to count how many kicks your baby was having so that you would be sure if the baby stopped moving that you wouldn't be embarrassed. You would immediately reach out to your physician or your midwife. We wanted to make sure that we retained the partnership because I'll tell you an interesting story. If you talk about black infant mortality, other cultures will come over and say, why don't you have an initiative to decrease East Asian infant death? And why don't you have a basic minority infant mortality initiative? Because you know, Puerto Rican babies also are born too small and too early. And our feeling was that we were concerned about death. Black infants die significantly more frequently than any other race. And if we don't keep focused on the group in highest need, then our efforts would be diluted. So keeping the partnership was a critical feature of success. This was interesting. Um, the Department of Health was willing to allow us to say that there were psychosocial factors that were likely to contribute to racial disparity. Does anybody here have any idea what psychosocial factors are? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, you can answer. This is an interactive session. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we found out was that psychosocial factors was a euphemism for racism, right? People are much more comfortable saying, psychological impediments prevent people from speaking nicely to one another. And it was a big challenge to try to get the government to allow us to publish that racism, in fact, was causing specific women to feel higher levels of stress. And I give credit to the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services because although they were uncomfortable, they let us publish the report as such. And that gave us the legs to walk into the Office of Medical Examiners so that the healthcare environment could become more sensitive to the needs of black women and providers could take courses in becoming more culturally competent. I remember seeing one little pamphlet that said, if you're black and you're pregnant, be sure to tell your provider about your HIV status. That was in the first sentence. You didn't even have a chance. In terms of behaviors and lifestyle, um, I think it's interesting to realize that it's not just the white population that has to be sensitive to black women who are pregnant, but black men and women need to be supportive of one another. That there's a lot of internal bias and perception of less than worthiness and acceptance of poor outcomes. We have a quote in that booklet where a black woman stated, if it's not hard, then it's not black, as to suggest that blacks lead hard lives, and that was what she believed was in her future. Therefore, if she were to lose her baby, that would be nothing strange, because her aunt lost her baby, and her sister lost her baby, and it was known in the church that miscarriages happen. So there was almost an acceptance as opposed to a defiance or a motivation to take action. We recognized, and many of you who are in healthcare know, that if you ask women to go to the doctor on 125th Street and then go down to 116th Street to get their sonogram 
and they have to speak to the genetic counselor at Columbia Presbyterian on 168th Street. If they're not feeling well, they can't navigate that. It's even worse in New Jersey because there's no public transportation infrastructure. So if you don't have a car, you need all those services to be in one place. We also, as I said before, tried to get physicians and nurses to recognize that black women who had miscarried before were in a particularly high-risk category, and they needed to have special attention, and they needed to be encouraged not to feel less than worthy that they had lost children, because it's a stigma. Let me tell you, if there's something wrong with your child, or if you lost your child, there's a little bit of shame and a little bit of blame. And you need to give women the support in return so they have the strength to carry on. We talked, and again, 20 years ago, the thought of an electronic medical record was a dream. Now it's much more of a reality. But issue, issues, I'm a hospital administrator, when you transpose that the baby was four grams, <laughs> and somebody writes 0.4 grams because there's a transposition error. That's a problem. And by having the electronic birth certificate, it decreases the potential for uh, medical errors. Now, our organization, the partnership, is specifically focused on the underserved, but here's big message number four. Affluent black women are not exempt they're not exempt. We went to one very powerful legislator um, in the New Jersey government, and we told her about these statistics, and she started to argue with us. And she said, I went to law school, and I'm in wonderful shape. I go to the gym, and I keep my weight down, and I'm not susceptible to what you're talking about. And I said, well, good luck to you. But here are the statistics. And she started to cry because she thought that through education and hard work, she had moved out of that high-risk category, and it's not so. In fact, there are studies that would suggest that affluent, working, professional black women are at higher risk. These are really significant findings that the report detailed this one is a troubling one because we didn't even listen to our own advice. When you get multiple uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to put into an initiative, if no one says you need to have an evaluation from the beginning and you don't start off with one, it's really hard to catch up to, up to it in year five. So anybody who ever thought about lobbying for funds, the evaluation strategy is critical because Here's lesson number five. The Black Infant Mortality Center, that was the result of this finding. We were able to mount a center exclusively focusing on research and, and publications focusing on the loss of life in the black community. It is no more. It is no more in New Jersey. There's a handful of money that's distributed through the state to look at reasons that are currently causing black women to lose their babies. But if the initiative isn't evaluated to demonstrate awareness was not significant, we were not able to decrease the black infant mortality rate enough to have the government feel as though they had their return on their investment. So if you don't have rigorous evaluation, and rigorous evaluation costs money. And if money has to be put into direct service, you lose the ability to be able to re-up the funding at the end of the cycle. Our hope is that the work that we've done through the center through all of our publications, which continue to grow, is that other academic centers, other places where there are enlightened, motivated, small bands of committed and enlightened individuals will take up this call for social equity in life, 
that they will continue to research the causes. There's not just one cause that black infants die more frequently than their other racial counterparts. There are a multitude of factors and we need to isolate each one and develop a strategy to combat each one of those. Just technically so that you know how we achieve the report, we divided ourselves, there were about 35 of us, we divided ourselves into to four groups. The PhDs went into the literature search so they could do the um, studies that were published. There was a group that liked to travel. They did the national search for best practices. The people who liked to stay at home did town meetings and we tried to cover northern, central, southern, and eastern part of the state. And the last group, which was the group that was most vocal and constantly fighting, was what was going to go into the report. Was it important to suggest that racism was a contributing factor? If you couldn't solve it, was it worth it to suggest it? I think one of the things that we tried to do was get an artist. We got a street artist to do the cover so that it was really a New Jersey publication, so that it wasn't Maryland's report or New York State's report. We wanted it to be homegrown. So we inserted quotes and we inserted artworks. Uh, artwork. We also, as I said before, made sure that the words of the women were not changed. We tried to be real. We tried to be transparent. As I said, there was a black infant mortality center established, which lasted over a decade, which was quite unique. And we are still asked to guide allocation decisions, which is a powerful role, so that when the government wants to release money in New Jersey, they still come to our organization and say, how can we help black women achieve healthier birth weights? healthier babies. I think we've talked about the fact that what was successful was the fact that we had a team approach. What was disturbing was that we found out that black women oftentimes had low self-esteem and that there were different levels of resiliency. Some black women would tell us that when they were shopping at Macy's, they felt as though everybody was looking at them. Other women said they didn't care. They didn't care. One of my colleagues said that I wake up in the morning and I don't think about what my race is until I get to work and everybody points to me and says, you know what, you're black. So this consciousness and how do you feel about being black and how, the, how do other people's opinion influence how you take that in was something that affected your mental health. And from an evaluation point of view, there's no question that if the national government were to look at this the same way that the state of New Jersey did, we would have some significant strides going forward. Implications, I think there are implications for women, for the black community, for the healthcare community. There's no question that Racism exists. We're not in a post-racial generation despite our president. It would be nice if we could figure out strategies to decrease stress, particularly for black women, not to suggest we're not concerned about the well-being of black men, but the woman who's carrying the baby, if she feels as though she's discriminated against, that affects her blood pressure, it affects her cortisol level, and it has an impact on the longevity of the baby in utero. And there are ways, very specific ways, that women can decrease their stress levels. And our, our goal is to try to find out why do black women have birth weights that are above five and six pounds. What have they done differently? How do they capture resiliency and peace of mind? So in conclusion, 
we had a successful state program increasing awareness of the devastation of black infant mortality. And what we're happy and proud about is that we made this topic on the tongues of every healthcare provider and every woman who is pregnant for a period of about 10 to 15 years. We are concerned, however, as Carolyn said earlier, that the economy is not strong now. The money for initiatives like this has decreased. We need to continue to stimulate other centers to learn about the work that we have done and to take over some of these publications and some of the fighting that that small band of concerned individuals started. I thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. On. okay, even though we are in an economically depressed time, and you have learned, you both have learned some lessons from what you have done, your programs. How do you, what strategies have you thought about to empower the community to take this on and make it part of its ongoing agenda? Yes, definitely. Um, sustainability is a very big thing and um, I think empowering the community, and when I say empowering, I mean giving them skills that make sense. So creating a train-the-trainer curriculum, if you will. How can women serve as peer-based supporters of each other? They don't need me. They don't need um, outside funding and research academicians, but giving them the tools to train each other, I think that's one of the best things I can do that I'm actually still working with them to complete a, a model or a curriculum where the women will train each other and support each other in that model, and then they'll be ambassadors and go out and recruit more women and bring them in. So it's like a snowball technique, if you will, but it's sustainable and it's a peer-based model. So that's one of the things that I'm working on. Thanks. Yeah, if I can just comment, you know, 20 years ago it was very difficult for me to find black men or women who had PhDs in New Jersey focused on maternal child health. I went to a conference and I found <laughs> Nadidi Amuta, thanks to one of the staff members of the partnership. There are talented women who are interested in community development. And what I would say to answer your question is that the community needs to connect to a university. When I was at college, the thought of doing black studies was non-existent. Now, it's a part of almost every single college. As we move where minorities are now majorities, whether you go to a marketing class or you go to a community development or urban development class, it's great to connect with an academic professor and then have the energy come from the community. The, the community has the actual stories and you write them down because there's a very rich oral history about women who have lost children. I would recommend that everybody in the room read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Has anybody read that book? I mean, that pretty much says it all. It's the intersection between racism and the paternalistic uh, pr uh, provision of medicine. And I think that we need to empower all women to question physicians and to fe be more confident about themselves. Yeah, 
I want to thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Thank um, you. Dr. Um, Amuta. Uh, I, 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 I meant to, is it Dor? Yeah. Carolyn. Carolyn. DeBoer. Oh, 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 okay. I'm, I'm mistaken. There's three. Okay. Um, well, my, my question has to do with, um, uh, in, in, well, I have two questions, one for each of you. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, but I, I just want to address you by name, and I just wanted to remember your name. My name? Yes. Elise. Elise, yes. Um, and, um, you know, you talked about, uh, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't sure if I was, uh, if I heard what was the, um, where the research um, uh, ended up in terms of why these women of color who were, you know, living, um, you know, uh, in the burbs, they were not um, women that were, you know, for particularly for some of the women that I work with that are, are teens and that are living in shelters and moving from one place to the next. Why did they have the same um, maternal outcomes? I'm not sure if I heard um, you know what your 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 research may have yielded. Uh, so if you can um, if you can uh, shed some light on that. Um, and and for you, <laughs> Doctor Amuta. Amuta yes. um, um, my question: You mentioned it, you mentioned the Healthy Families Program, which I think I know which one you're talking about. And you said this was it was the only evidence-based um, program in 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 Maryland. And so I guess I wanted to, I guess my, my, my question would be, uh, how would that apply then to, um, to programs that were not evidence-based and, and, and would, would working with such, such programs, would that, would that turn that around? I mean, so much of the money is driving, you know, this evidence-based stuff, and obviously, you know, it's not always easy to, um, you know, to, it, like she said, if you haven't started this evaluation program from day one, you know, to be able to uh, quantify all of these results and all of this good, um, you know, the good progress. So what, you know, how would, it, would, would the type of thing that you did um, apply to uh, another program and would that, would that substitute or constitute evidence-based? Okay, you have... <laughs> A lot of questions, which I appreciate. So I'm going to answer that, then I'll pass it over to Elise. Um, so in addition to the Healthy Families America, there are other curriculums that entities can implement. But if you don't have the resources to to conduct a Healthy Families America model from start to finish, you can definitely borrow pieces and make your own program, which will still be based in evidence, but it may not be packaged as such. So for instance, if there are components of the Healthy Families America model, Mary Parents as Teachers, the Nurse Family Partnership, and creating your own, partner, your own curriculum that is evident of the community that you're working in, that's reflective of that particular community, I would say that that's just as good as an evidence-based model that has been vetted and pilot tested. But I, I can talk to you further about some ideas, but that's the best thing that I can think of at this time. Does that answer your question? <laughs> you know, I'm sort of somewhat new to the to the field and to some of the work. Mm -hmm. um, my background is more on the policy side and the political stuff. Okay. But um, so, you know, is there a, a prescribed, um, you know, group of, of who is determining the evidence based and uh, what's the authority there? I'm also a lay person. Nadidi is a PhD, so let me see if I can explain it to you in layman's terms. When something is called evidence-based, that means that some researcher or research team has conducted an evaluation very rigorously, so they've compared if you did this intervention, what was the outcome, versus if you didn't do this intervention, what is the outcome. That's where the evidence comes in. So. Dr. Amuta, as a young researcher, has just said, you can connect or you can stimulate the growth of either a program that is evidence-based or responsive to your community. And I, as a seasoned mentor of Nadidi, would say, Google evidence-based programs in your neighborhood because to be able to secure money 
Right now, the in vogue term is it has to be documented as working. In a tight economy, you don't have the luxury of mounting your own creative program. So nurse family partnership, healthy families, parents as teachers, these are programs where universities have researched what the outcome is. And the outcome is that the child is either born healthier or that the, uh, that the concept of child abuse has been diminished. So you want to go with, my feeling is that you want to go with an ev evidence-based program and make sure that women in the community know about these options and if you're an advocate and a policy maker that you direct people to continue to fund those programs because the results are found to work and they're generally accepted and you don't have to fight constantly for funding. The funding will flow. When President Obama uh, announces that home visitation works, home visitation means people coming into pregnant women's homes, almost like the old-fashioned nurse uh, visitors, the visiting nurse service, we're back to what was done in the 1940s and the 1950s, but now it's not just nurses because that's high labor cost. We also teach women in the community, and that's what Healthy Families is, teaching women in the community to help their peers with strategies that are evidence-based. So it's not just, I think you should drink milk, but here is the diet for a healthy pregnancy. It's more prescribed. You want to rebut that? No, I think that's great. But I'm, I want to make sure that answers your question. You did say, okay. The work that you're doing, mm -hmm. and um, you know, for uh, how how would that lead to becoming evidence evidence based? Obviously, I mean, I do you know understand um, uh, about the issue, particularly in terms of funding. But um, there are you know amazing programs out there, you know, um, such as Healthy Start that um, you know may, are are not considered evidence based, but are doing amazing work. And so I, I was trying to explore uh, okay. the work that you did with these clients and and whether that worked as far as evidence-based, and I guess your answer was, um, you know, certainly, and, and you also were saying you can pick from, uh, you know, and uh, from some of these, I guess, you know, I guess you could do best practices, but um, right. and as far the, as evidence-based, you know, you want to develop your program as such. Right, and so the evaluation was, was based in Healthy Families, which is housed at the federal level and Health Resources and Services Administration. So it was very much based on one particular model, which was Healthy Families. But we can continue to talk if, you know. I have uh, questions from the web. Oh, that's great. Okay. You have a couple hundred people watching. Wow. <laughs> um, first one is, um, uh, are there plans to do research on the African-American women who, have, who do have health weight babies and good survival rate? and to compare that with current birth weight and death statistics? I think that's a brilliant suggestion. I'm not a researcher, but here's a true story about networking. I met Dr. Barbara Wallace in San Francisco at APHA. She invited me to come here. While I was at that conference, I met Dr. Nadidi Amuta. If I had my druthers, I would turn over all the work that we've done to these two academicians because we need to have scientific research. And my first suggestion is exactly from the person asking the question. I would like to see a comparative study of black women from similar backgrounds who lost their babies before the age of one and who didn't lose their babies before the age of one because I'm not, I haven't found that study, and I think that that study needs to be done. So I think it's absolutely on target. Can I um, 
Just to add to that a little bit, um, in addition to looking at, so the person is suggesting looking at um, birth weight from a resiliency perspective, right? And there are definitely, um, at least in my immediate research agenda, that is at the top of my list. There are other initiatives going around the country that are focusing on healthy babies and um, positive outcomes for women of color. Two in particular are the Healthy Baby Zone, which is funded by the Kellogg Foundation. That is being piloted in four cities to look at birth outcomes across different variables of women and different demographics. And also um, by the March of Dimes, Healthy Babies Are Worth the Wait, and that's an evaluation project going on in three cities, one of which is Newark, New Jersey. So there's definitely some research and some momentum around this um, topic and looking at healthy birth outcomes for women of color, not just focusing on the disparities and inequities, but looking to see what are women doing right and building on that model of care. And the other thing I think in addition to that is that many of the um, the monies that are coming down are not for evidence-based or best practices. Yeah. So understanding that best practices is, is another um, avenue. It's not always, yes, evidence-based, but going toward a best practice that can be evaluated to determine that it is evidence-based. And I guess the other thing to look at too, and I think you made the point of it, is beginning to segment into not only comparing um, babies that are born healthy, African and black African American babies that are born healthy to those women whose babies are not, but also begin to segment the population to think about the fact that black African Americans are not a homogeneous group mm -hmm. and begin to look at immigrant women yeah. from not only the continent of Africa but the Caribbean and also in the United States and make some comparisons across the board. I mean, we talk about it all the time that the birth outcomes for women that are from Africa and certain Caribbean countries are closer um, to those of white or Asian women than they are to African American women. After two or three generations, they start to mirror African American women. So it's like, what happens? Exactly. Thank you for that. There um, are definitely some glimpses of that analysis being able to be culled from secondary data, right? So looking at large-scale data, like the, um, the new immigrant survey, there's some, some things, but the sample sizes may not be large enough, but it's, it's a start, and it's a, it's a walk in the right direction, and that's definitely something that I and other colleagues are interested in looking at further, and then moving to the point of collecting pilot data and going for larger pools of money to kind of look at this large scale is something that is very much um, at the beginning of my research agenda. So thank you for that. Another question from the web. It seems both projects place an emphasis on individual and community level approaches to addressing infant mortality in the black community. I'm curious what, if any, efforts are being directed towards institutional level and policy level changes. That's a great. Do you want to take that? Sure, Nadidi gives me the hard questions. <laughs> I will tell you that there is a different consciousness um, in strong economics times and weak economic times. And I think that right now, particularly in New Jersey, if you were to go to a meeting of the Senate Health Committee, the focus is on recovering from Sandy. And if you were to go, um, uh, I would say maybe 10 years ago, the focus was on Governor Cody's wife who suffered from postpartum depression. And so there was tremendous uh, release of funding on the topic of mental health. And right now, at least in New Jersey, it's somewhat quiet. We haven't had a strong advocate and I guess my message is that you need to have a champion whether it's a small band of individuals or it's a famous baseball player you need someone to start being act up and I think that the question about the legislature or the government government is reflective of people's wills so if there's not the political will to make a change then you're not going to see it by your elected officials. It has to be a grassroots level or a very strong group of influential people to make change. Very well said. Another question. 
Okay. I enjoyed the presentations and learned a lot from you all. Do we know whether the higher IMR in African American women is due to higher distribution of LBW babies or is it due to higher birth rate specific mortality among the babies? Birth, higher birth rate specific mortality. Um, no, I, I think there's no clear answer to that. It, I would say that it's a combination of many things that, that, that lead to higher IMR. Yes, definitely um, babies being born low birth weight, but even when you disentangle um, birth weight and you look at and you look at the time that the woman delivered, and you, I mean, there's so many factors. So I don't, I don't know if there's one clear answer that I would say this is the standout reason for this particular disparity of infant mortality. I'd say it's a combination of many things, but I'll pass this. So there is a methodology that was developed by an organization called City Match, um, which works in maternal child health, and they, uh, it's called perinatal periods of risk, and it talks about um, sectioning off the mortality that you see into um, fetal mortality and different periods of infant mortality, whether it was neonatal or postneonatal, and looking at birth weight as well. And so it's a methodology for isolating at what point there is excess mortality compared to an index population. So in this case, you'd be looking at a black population versus, um, you know, maybe a white non-Hispanic population or the total population. What they've found with that, and they've been using um, perinatal periods of risk in a lot of different places, is that um, it varies drastically. Um, we had a group that came in from Wisconsin, and they had found that the um, excess mortality there was mostly post-neonatal. And City Match will give you some suggestions. Maybe that has to do with things like sleep position or, you know, the environment that the, you know, in the household, that kind of thing. Um, here in New Jersey, it's difficult, well not here, but in New Jersey, <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to say because our numbers are not huge, um, but it's mostly, it appears to mostly be um, fetal mortality, which is babies that are born too early, um, you know, mo uh, moms that go into labor well before the time where the baby would be viable. So it, it depends, every population is a little bit different, and I think it gets back to the fact that there's not just one cause for this disparity. Please discuss any emerging interventions developed to address the impact of legacy of racism on the mental well-being of African American women. What can we do now instead of waiting for social equity to oh, ameliorate? Ameliorate. Sorry. <laughs> the problem. Um, so one thing that I've thought about um, are different uh, racial scales that we can use to measure the impact of racism. Um, two things, actually. So looking at um, different scales that have been developed by researchers across the country to really try to get at perceptions of racism and um, to quantify that. But in addition to that, you also have um, opportunities for women to just talk about what it means to be racist. And you see that when you put women in racially charged situations that their cortisol levels go up, their allostatic load is affected. So there's definitely physiologic responses to racism. But as far as interventions, um, I think that's a really good question. And there's, I don't know one in particular I can say yes, but I know that there are measures that have been developed and evaluated and researched, but I don't know of specific interventions that will focus on the impact of racism. We, we did hold one program called Reduce Stress for Babies Best, and if you're interested in it, you can Google Yvonne Wesley, W-E-S-L-E-Y. She has a publication that talked about the outcome, that if you take women, black women, who are pregnant, and you teach them deep breathing, or you teach them journaling, or you access them into a yoga class. There are ways to decrease stress. And I think what's fascinating about the scales of racism is that, you know, Nadidi is black, and you may not know that, but I am not. And what's interesting is that she may be less hurt, she may be, her, her allostatic load, her stress level may be less, if somebody says something nasty to her versus if someone says something nasty to me. 
And I think what's interesting, and this is what's very individualistic, is how do you as an individual, and I think this gets to the question about our emotional state of being, how do you handle the stimuli that's thrown on you, whether you're black, white, male, female, if you're in an environment that's terribly stressful, do you recognize and do something about it, or do you just let it suck the life out of you? That's a very important individual strategy. And I think particularly women who are pregnant need to realize that they need to decrease their stress level because they're carrying responsibility for two lives at that particular point in time. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here in the audience? I think that the contact information is now available. Yes. And I just wanted yeah. to say, yeah, yeah to. thank you to thank Nadidi. You. We actually didn't know we were going to be on the panel together, but we collaborate. And Carolyn, who has been a tremendous source of inspiration for me to keep going. And we'll be happy to stay after if anybody has any questions. And thank you for your kind attention.